What do you think, therefore, you've dealt with a lot of these challenges in terms of that people are putting up against uh, Christian belief. What do you think are the biggest challenges for people uh, accepting or even considering Christian belief, in the, especially in the West yes. today? Well, now, the most significant challenges culturally may not be intellectual in nature. I think perhaps one of the greatest obstacles is the kind of scientism that seems to pervade popular culture. And this is very strange because this sort of view of knowledge is completely eclipsed and abandoned among philosophers who specialize in this area. But there is a very widespread belief that the only source of knowledge and truth is physical science. And that if something can't be proven through the physical sciences, it's meaningless or uh, cannot be known. And that, I think, is simply a false and self-refuting theory of knowledge. I mean, consider the statement, you should only believe what can be scientifically proven. Can that statement be scientifically proven? Well, obviously not. It's just an arbitrary definition. So that the view is literally self-refuting. And yet, this seems to persist in popular culture very widely and prevents people, I think, from finding spiritual truth and spiritual knowledge. It's the case that people don't live like it's true that there's only materialistic, physical answers to the deep questions. That's a good point. They don't understand that in the way they treat other people and expect to be treated, they are affirming moral values and intrinsic worth of human beings in a way that cannot be established scientifically. Science is ethically neutral. It tells us how the world is but it doesn't tell us how the world ought to be. For that, you need ethics, and yet ethics are inescapable in everyday life. Every day we wake up, we determine by how we treat other people whether or not we think that moral values are objective or just subjective opinions in our head. The uh, philosopher Alain de Botton makes the case that we ca it is logical to say that we can lead morally perfect lives without recourse to the divine. How do you respond to that? I would say that's the wrong question, Simon. The issue is not whether we need to believe in God in order to live good and decent lives. I'm not claiming that it's belief in God that's necessary. Rather, my argument is that we need God himself to serve as a transcendent foundation and plumb line for objective good and evil, right and wrong. And whether or not you need to believe in this in order to live a good life is, is really quite irrelevant. It's God that is necessary for objective moral values to exist, not belief in God. In response to the fine-tuning of the universe as a possibly a pointer towards God, we're yes. sometimes told that a multiverse does away with the need for this appearance of design. You know, we just happen to be in one of billions of universes uh, in which the properties required for life to exist as we know it are in place. This multiverse gets a bit of a run. Uh, mm -hmm. What's your response to it? I would say that even if a multiverse exists, it does not explain the fine-tuning. This point has been uh, made very forcefully by Roger Penrose of Oxford University. What Penrose points out is it, is it is incomprehensibly more probable that our solar system would just instantaneously form through the random collision of particles than that a finely tuned universe would exist. What that means is that there are far more universes in this multiverse in which observers form just by the random collision of particles than finely tuned worlds. So if we were just a random member of a multiverse, we ought to be observing an island of order no bigger than our solar system, because that's incomprehensibly more probable than a finely tuned universe. In fact, the most probable observable universe would be a universe in which a single brain fluctuates into existence out of the quantum vacuum and observes its otherwise empty world. So if we were just a random member of a multiverse, we ought to be having observations like that. And since we don't, that strongly disconfirms the multiverse hypothesis. To what extent does some doubt play a role in a life of faith, committed faith? 
I think that traditionally Christian theologians and ordinary believers have understood that doubt actually is part of the life of faith. Very often great saints of God have gone through what they call the dark valley in which God may not seem real to them and they trust in God to get them through that dark valley and bring them out on the other side. And this is not inimical to faith or contrary to faith. This is a part, I think, of the life of faith, to trust in God just as Job in the Old Testament trusted in God as he went through terrible suffering and loss. And this isn't a blind or irrational faith. On the contrary, in those moments where we go through the dark valley, it can be helpful to remember all of the good reasons and evidence for God's existence that our faith is not based just on emotions, but it's based upon the truth, and therefore we can trust God to help get us through those difficult times. The physicist Lawrence Krauss, who you've been debating, argues that not only did the universe not need a God to come into existence, that it probably happened without one. What's your quick response to that? This was the subject of our Sydney debate. Why is there something rather than nothing? And what I pointed out is that when Dr. Krauss uses the word nothing, in every case he is really referring to a physical system that simply undergoes a change of state from one state to another. And to call this nothing is grossly misleading, if not a deliberate misrepresentation of science. The physical theories that Dr. Krauss discusses have zero relevance to the question of how the universe could come into being from literally nothing. So he smuggles in something. He says, the question, why is there something rather than nothing, sounds like a religious question, but he says, I use it to sneak in modern cosmology. And I think that's very unfortunate because modern cosmology is fascinating enough in its own right that we don't need to try to sneak it in by having it masquerade as an answer to a philosophical question. Yes, and we've had physicists come in here who are quite happy with uh, Krauss's depiction of that early state of the yes. universe. I uh, don't feel like it has any bearing on the God question at all. Exactly. That the issue is not the science. It's his misuse of science to represent it as an answer to a philosophical question. And I think in so doing, Dr. Krauss has actually impeded rather than aided the public understanding of science. Thank you.